In my Yellow Brick Road analysis, I mentioned that film was the closest we'd ever get to a House of Leaves adaptation. That, ultimately, was in reference to the way the land shifted around them, playing with concepts of time and space, as well as driving the expedition quite mad. There are other films that pick up other aspects of House of Leaves, such as Johnny's Obsession appearing in the number 23. However, none of them quite reached the book's glory. Seeing as there will never be a film adaptation of that novel, at least not outright, today we're going to talk about Mark C. Danielewski's debut novel, House of Leaves. Be sure to stick around after the credits to hear about some of Mark's other works. Released in 2000, House of Leaves is a maze that puts you in a nesting doll structure of narratives. Simply put, this novel is a man's descent into insanity. It contains three interconnected stories told like a dissertation about a seven-year-old film that doesn't exist, written by a man who's been blind for 40 years, about a house that is bigger on the inside than it is on the outside, compiled by a local tattoo artist after the original writer's death, with interspersed hints about his clinically insane mother, perhaps even revealing that this work is more of a letter to his mother than an authentic academic work, and that doesn't even scratch the surface. I picked this up somewhere around 2007, years after it had gained a cult following. In the confusion of where to put it, it either gets lumped in literature or horror. Most people I know glom onto the latter definition, marking it horror, while others have said it's a love story or a mockery of modern academia. I'm not really sure where I fall in this camp. There are definitely horrific elements to the story, but the main text reads like a dissertation. However, the main exploration has a Lovecraftian element, or perhaps a Silent Hill 2 apartment vibe, where something sinister is out of sight, but you can hear it, and that's creepier than you realize. My first introduction to this novel was with the two color edition. I spent weeks pouring through the text, attempting to find translations for the foreign languages even if I wasn't quite sure which one they were. I filled the margins with my notes, only for it to disappear out of my first house with roommates. I guess I should slow down and try to actually explain what Mark Z. Danielewski's House of Leaves actually is. The main text contains the Navitzen Record, a documentary that the blind Zampano wrote using the help of his home health nurses. It is a horror story told with footnotes, oblique references, struck through passages, as well as appendices, photos, and an index that covers every page that the word so is on. I'm not joking. To help you differentiate the stories, Danielewski uses fonts perfectly. The Navitzen Record is written in Times New Roman whereas the footnotes from the tattoo artist Johnny Truant are written in Courier New, allowing us to see an immediate difference in who is talking and what their notes will contain. The third storyline is told through Johnny's mother, Pelafina, and her letters from the Three Attic Wellstow Institute. As these letters show her mental deterioration that lead to her eventual death, her font comes in Dante. I'm sure there's no explicit reason for choosing that font, right? On purely face value, the story is about Will Navidson and his attempts to record his family moving into a new house in Virginia. One day, a mysterious cupboard opens up, revealing a space when measured is a quarter of an inch larger than the inside of the house should be. After remeasuring the entire house, he finds that his impossible numbers are correct. From there, the passage grows. There's a notorious sequence called the five and a half minute hallway. It's alluded to multiple times, taking place in different parts of the house, but in all accounts, the doorway to it shouldn't exist, as it would lead straight outside of the house into the yard. Think the impossibilities of the Overlook Hotel from The Shining. If you're unfamiliar with the oddities of The Shining's eponymous hotel, check out Collative Learning's two-part special on spatial awareness in The Shining. There will be links in the description below. Eventually, they put together an exploration party and head into the heart of the house. What they find there is a dense, cavern-like structure with great halls, passages that branch off in all directions, and a giant staircase that spirals downward into an endless abyss. The featureless gray walls feel as if they were erected in an effort to revel in this darkness. As they move deeper, the house growls in protest. Although that inhuman sound is attributed to the house continually growing and shifting, the grand staircase at its heart is initially so tall that they have to crawl their way down, each step being taller than them. However, near the end, when things spiral out of control and they're trying to escape, the staircase is regular size as they sprint up it. That being said, the house seems to reshape itself and act with the intention of those inside its steps, sealing the explorers inside the house after a firefight. And no matter what angle you come at it from, there's a good story there. You can read this entire novel reading Zampano's storylines only. 
You can jump into Johnny's world and traipse around the footnotes, uncovering his story while this mountain of text dances on the horizon, always there beckoning you, but you don't have to go there to get a complete, if somewhat lost, story. Or if you're feeling particularly brave, you can slip into the three appendices that range from instructions of what should go there to poetry, drawings, and mixed media images that imprint more of the story into your subconscious. For me, the thing with the most worth and merit in these tangled appendices is Pelafina's contribution to the story, with the three Attic Wellstow Institute letters. In the original novel, they took up a meager 58 pages, but having more to add to this angle of the story, Danielewski released the Wellstow letters, with a total of 83 pages of Pelafina's descent into madness. Here, you find P's various elements play out in some whiplash tendencies, at one moment praising Johnny and hoping for the best, the next trashing him for moving on for forgetting his mother. In one of her letters, there's a throwaway comment that she doesn't trust the staff's handling of her correspondence. So she asks Johnny to place in your next letter a check mark in the lower right hand corner. Don't make the check mark too big or too small. Our little code, so effortless and yet so rich in communication. When reading the Navidson record, on page 97 you come across such a check mark. At the time, you haven't read Pelafina's stories. Instead, it appears without commentary or context, so I, and I assume most readers, dismissed it at the time as just one more oddity in the story. In one of her later letters, she lays out a message using only the first letter of every word. While decoding this adds another layer to her lunacy, it also has the line. A face in a cloud, no trace in the crowd, spelt out through oddly capitalized letters in the middle of words, perhaps in a way to get you to look at the letter more closely and discover the code. Shortly after this cipher, her letters degrade into a jumble of text, twisting and moving erratically across the page, similar to the twisting notes of Zampano. Of course, this adds another layer of doubt as to whether any of this was Zampano's doing, or if this was Johnny's own descent into madness in the form of this rambling novel. All these stories are told with an eye for detail, sometimes overwhelmingly so, such as Zampano's Chapter 5, which spends most of its time looking at the properties of sound and the history of the word echo. In one section, Zampano provides almost three pages worth of footnotes with lists of photographers to look into, along with some names of the pieces, only for you at the end of that footnote to have another footnote from Johnny explaining that, the list was entirely random. Burns told me I'd describe a picture or two and he'd say no or that's fine. A few times he just told me to choose a page and point. Johnny pulls the same stunt, taking up entire pages in the footnotes with no new Navidson record information above or contained within. Sometimes there are comments on the work, other times they are translations to the best of his ability, but I think singularly Johnny starts using the stacked footnotes to explore his life. In these passages, Johnny gives us a peek into his life as he compiles this monster of a novel. These asides contain sexual encounters, hallucinations, run-ins with monsters, recreational drug use, as well as how the story is affecting him both emotionally and mentally. I see these asides as Danielewski seeing how far he can push things while keeping people in Interested. To make matters worse in the footnotes, there are times when Zampano has something written in a foreign language, Johnny will use a footnote to post its translation, only for the editors to add another footnote on top of that to correct Johnny. Just to add to the confusion, the editor's font is in Bookman. Speaking of the editors, they are a guiding force at times, even though they're never properly identified. They're mostly there to step in, correct any wrong information, or pipe in with a helpful, Mr. Truant declined to comment further on this passage. It's sometimes infuriating to have no clear answers and the questions spiraling out of control. And this is all before the text itself begins to revolt, refusing to stay on the set lines like other novels before it, instead twisting and turning and repeating itself, forwards and backwards, constraining itself to a block in the middle of the page. The true madness begins about a fifth into the book, when Zampano starts striking all references to the Minotaur and the mythology surrounding it. It's this expectation and uprooting that seems to have driven either Johnny or Zampano off the edge. The editors do go out of their way to point out that Johnny never elaborated, whether this was Johnny's doing or a remnant of Zampano's scattered notes. Some of my favorite moments late in the novel are when the text represents what is happening on the film. At one point, as a series of doors are slamming shut, only one word appears on each page. While it is extremely gimmicky, what it does is control our momentum and pace. When only a few words appear on a page, you flip through them with a madman's veracity. However, he then throws in a paragraph or two at the bottom of the page, slowing you down, making you take a breather, before suddenly the frenetic pages are back. 
The text twists and turns, so much so that you have to take this tome and flip it end over end as you read. This is not a passive experience. The final bit of extraneous storytelling that helps expand this work is Poe's companion album, Haunted. You see, Poe's real name is Anne Danielewski. She's Mark's sister. On her first album, Hello, there's a song called Angry Johnny that is a direct reference to Johnny Truant. For her second album, each song provides a commentary on all three storylines of House of Leaves. Some of these are subtle hints, while other songs like Exploration B and Five and a Half Man Hallway are direct references to sequences in the novel. Mark reads a passage from House of Leaves on the song Hey Pretty. To further highlight the Uroboros, that is the Danielewski's creations, near the end of House of Leaves, Johnny comes out of the daze to find that Zampano's story has been picked up by the masses. He learns this through a band that's playing at a local bar where he picks up the lyric, I live at the end of a five and a half minute hallway, the same featured in Poe's song of the same name. While it took Mark 10 years to produce the novel, the intense, twisting typography took him over nine months to solidify it. Early bindings of the book had a loose first page. When laid out, the left side read Mark C. Danielewski's, while the right had Zampano's House of Leaves. However, the binding was made to lose that first page, making it discard Mark as its true author. Even in my full-color second edition copy of the book, I was able to effortlessly remove the first page, making my book a true Zampano copy. There are multiple versions of the novel, ranging from an incomplete version to the final full-color edition. In between, we have the strict black and white version, as well as the two-color edition, where you could either have every mention of house in blue, or struck passages in red, along with any mention of the Minotaur. If there's anything you can say about Mark, he's rigid in his ideas, and will do whatever it takes to make them happen. He has been adamant that this is a print-only story, and he doesn't condone any adaptations or variations on the base text. Where ebooks have been a craze for many years now, you can only buy House of Leaves in trade paperback. Hell, Infinite Jest received an audiobook treatment, with its footnotes set aside in an effort to cover everything. But for Mark, print is its only medium. He does not want a film made of this story, no matter what angle they take. For all its flaws, Yellow Brick Road manages to get the cynical spirit of the house into the woods of New Hampshire. Dylan states that the numbers seem to match up going forward, but when you look back, that's where it all breaks apart. Nothing fits together. There's no clear path. And I was left with the feeling that, even though it's outside in the sunshine, that this was the closest we'd ever get to a proper House of Leaves. That is, until I saw the trailer for Dave Made a Maze. Now, I understand this is a weird thing to mention. Obviously, the movie hasn't come out yet, but the look and feel of parts of that trailer made me feel like someone had just finished reading House of Leaves and found out that this was the only way that they could do it by turning it into a comedy and change that mysterious extra half inch into a cardboard maze that's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. <sighs> Yet another Doctor Who reference. Hell, they even have a minotaur. And that'll do it. But if you've got a taste for the weird, I thoroughly recommend you check out House of Leaves. Not only is it a one-of-a-kind experience, but it is also expertly told, pulling you into its strange world with a deft hand. It introduces concepts to you slowly, like a board game, ramping them up until they've taken you to a place you never imagined. Then again, you could fall into the camp of a few of my friends, calling House of Leaves postmodern bullshit. As always, you can read about me, myself, and mine at justindheard.net. I'm also on Twitter, at Justin D. Heard. You can also listen to our unfiltered thoughts by picking up the Dubious Consumers podcast. Make sure to check out my Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Justin D. Heard. For only $1, you can get early looks at the scripts for my next episode, get your name recognized at the end of each video, like Mr. Jeff Strait. Add to that, it's the only way to request videos as well as influence future content. While you're setting fire to the hive this week, be sure to send out the smoke signals of like, share, and subscribe. Be sure to hit the bell to get notifications on all our past and future content. It's a huge way to help this channel, and it's the only way we grow. Now, let's get that last bit of information out. In the years since House of Leaves has been released, we've been treated to more and more of Danielewski's oddities. His sophomore effort was a book called Only Revolutions, which is told in free verse poetry in a reversible book where there are two stories on each page, each with 180 words told over 360 pages, with the font sizes growing and diminishing as the stories are told. Along the right-hand side is a timetable that runs the gamut from November 22, 1863 to June 19, 2063, as a god chases his love through 200 years of our country's history, always remaining 16 years old. If you are ever to attempt this book, you are supposed to read seven pages of one, flip the book over, 
get the other side of the story and repeat ad nauseum until the book is done. The only other book I own of his is The Fifty Year Sword, which is actually a live shadow puppet show that's performed on Halloween night. The actual text is even more convoluted than that of the twisting House of Leaves or the mind-bending insanity of Only Revolutions. Instead, The Fifty Year Sword tells a story entirely through colored quotation marks. There are five colors, purple, yellow, red, blue, and orange, and all we're given to identify these characters are oblique references, such as two of whom still nurture their affection for one another, expressing so in an array of notes and overseas phone calls without identifying which color goes with the description. It's a maddening read unless you have friends to read their respective parts in this 285-page performance. On a final note, he's in the process of releasing a 27-volume set of novels called The Familiar. To set your mind at rest, Mark is still up to his usual tricks. The books are 880 pages long, with nine different characters, each using a different font with a colored tab in the upper right-hand corner to set each character apart. Then again, I don't think we'd expect anything else from Mr. Danielewski. Until next time, this has been Dubious Consumption, and I'm Outro.